Hello, and today our guest is Professor Aviva Ben Or. Hello, Aviva. How are you doing? Hello, Lipton Matthews. Good to be here. Nice to see you. I read your article some time ago, Aviva, and I really like it. Af I, I actually read your piece after I had written an article discussing slave ownership and I explored Native Americans who own slaves and also Blacks who own slaves because presently in America the perception is that slavery is par peculiar and particular to America. There are college students who actually believe that Americans invented slavery. So I decided to do some research to sh shed light on the issue, not for political reasons, but I don't like when people in the 21st century spout ignorance. We don't have a reason to be ignorant. There's the internet. We can do our research. So we're going to talk about your article titled Close Kin Ownership in American Slave Societies. Aviva, did Blacks own slaves for benevolent reasons or were they are or were they also entrepreneurial? So first of all, to understand this and actually riffing off of the comment you just made, the important thing as a historian is not to center ethnicity when you study slavery. You must center slave society itself. And a slave society, as defined by most historians, is a society in which of a very significant proportion of the residents are enslaved. And the, this percentage is so high that the entire economy would collapse should you suddenly manumit all of the slaves or remove them through expulsion or massacre. The classical slave societies, of course, date to classical antiquity. So Rome and ancient Greece were slave societies. About one third of the residents were enslaved. And this is also true for many of the hemispheric American societies, including, I think, Georgia, certainly, but of course, the Caribbean, many of the Caribbean islands and the literal Caribbean had majority populations who were either enslaved or of slave origins. So you can see that slavery is, is a world phenomenon. It is known to every sedentary society. And therefore, we have to forefront that before we even get to the really good question you asked, why did close kin, why did, why did people own their close kin if they themselves previously were slaves or of slave origin? All right, so I, I started the, the conversation along this line to combat some of the earlier research done by Carter G. Woodson, because he posited that slave ownership in black communities was primary benevolent. And certainly for North America, there are probably more cases of that. And I, I do believe it's a factor of majority populations, whether so in, in the United States, it was very difficult to be a manumitted person. So though that those communities of manumitted people of African origin are very small in general in the United States, particularly in the North. So there you're not going to find very much exploitative slave ownership by people who are themselves who were themselves of slave origins. But as you get down south, uh, southward of the US, particularly in the Caribbean and Brazil, for example, where the majority free populations were of slave origins, then, you, then it runs the gamut. Then you can see former slaves owning their own kin to keep the family together and for eventual manumission purposes. But probably, and as I argue in my article, probably the majority of free people of slave origins are owning slaves for exploitative reasons, for commercial reasons, both slaves that are not biologically or, or um, in terms of sexual relationships uh, related to them, and also um, owning slaves who are biologically related to them. Aviva, we're going to talk about a fascinating character. Her name is Rosa Judia. Rosia Judia is quite compelling. She was a free woman of color in Suriname and she legated slaves to a relative and actually instructed him to free them after his demise. That's right. So Rosa Judia was on the face of it, 
astonishing and she would raise your eyebrows this woman she is a spanish speaking portuguese jew and she is also a slave owner and a former slave herself so all of that is very unusual especially if you come from a perspective of north american slavery but if you put surinamese slave society on its own terms this is not unusual rosa judea was not unusual for example one third of the white population in Suriname was Jewish, and it stands to reason that they created a population of Euro-African descent, which indeed they did. And also the majority of free people by, the, by about 1811 in Suriname were of slave origins themselves. So she, Rosa Judia owned her own close relatives, her niece and her, the niece's children, so Fenchi and Ayaya, and she bequeathed these close kin to, I think it was her nephew, Avraham. It's been seven years since I wrote the article, so the details are a little hazy in my mind. But she be bequeathed this, um, the, these people, these close kin, to, um, no, I'm Ibram, forgetting his name. Her name Ibram, the nephew name is Ibram, Ismail. Ismail, Ismail Avraham. And, and she, what's very interesting of this about this case is at first glance you would say oh okay so she bequeathed her close kin to her nephew Ismail Avraham because she wanted to keep the family together and she wanted to protect these close kin from a stereotypically cruel white master who would separate the family and batter the people living within slavery. But if you look closely at the case, she's directing her nephew to keep those individuals enslaved, those nieces enslaved during his entire lifetime and gives him free reign to exploit them economically, to use them for his pleasure. And the word in Dutch is genieten und genieten, to enjoy them economically. And this is not an isolated case. I read will after will that replicated these kinds of tactics and this kind of language. And again, when I read these cases, I didn't think, oh, this is something quintessential about people of sub-Saharan African origin. I read it as this is something quintessential about a slave society. I agree, I agree with, with you. Slave society had its own unique dynamics. Human beings are interested in money. They also care about status and power. And at that time, accumulating slaves was one strategy to enhance power. Exactly. And it was actually the only path to wealth. In a slave study, the only path to wealth was ownership in human beings. So you, you could buy a plot of land, but the plot of land was useless unless you had people to cultivate it. And in fact, the land could be taken away from you by the colonial government if you did not cultivate it. That was the colonial law. So the only path to wealth and the only path to maintain your wealth was actually to purchase human beings and have them work for you, work the land and in an urban environment as, as well, work as, as your domestic to keep your status intact. As you mentioned, it's not just about money, it's also about status. The example of Africa in this context is quite riveting. One historian writes that in Africa, the currency was people, not land, because Africa is abundant in land. That's right. Yes, wealth in, in people rather than wealth in land. And, and I believe that that was also um, Joseph Miller's point in one of his books. And what's fascinating there too, is you see close kin ownership there as well. And so some, some historians have played with the idea, oh, maybe this close kin ownership phenom phenomenon in the Americas actually came from Africa. Maybe it was a cultural legacy from Africans imported against their will and eventually manumitted. But, but I actually, I don't think that is the case. I think you have to take everything on its own terms and the system in Africa too involved slave raiding, so raiding human beings and enslaving them. And, uh, and that was very different from what was happening in the Americas where, where the people were, were legally purchased. And in Africa, the system of pawning was maintained for a longer period. Even in the 20th century, historians have deduced examples of pawning. 
That's right. Yes. And of course, as Kevin Bale shows us, slavery still exists today, regard, you know, despite the pious declarations that slavery is a thing of the past. It's not. Kevin Bales, who wrote a book called Slavery by Another Name, and you can see slavery all over the United States, all over the world, just in a different guise. The last slave, the, the last political entity that had legal slavery, I believe was Saudi Arabia, and they abolished slavery in the 1960s. But that doesn't mean that the phenomenon, the quasi-legal institution of slavery died, it didn't, it continues, and severe exploitation, capitalistic exploitation of human beings continues to this day. And also there, there are certain civilizations around the world who incorporate slavery as part of their, of their cultural system. And, it's, and these are typically illiterate societies who don't write the system down on paper. But in fact, slavery is existing as well as close kin ownership in those societies. And Aviva, the imprint of slavery remained in the region of the former Sokota Caliphate in, even in the 1980s. And unfortunately, I read an article published by the BBC last year arguing that the Usu slaves in, sorry, that the descendant of the Usu slaves in Nigeria, they still encounter discrimination even when they're affluent. Right, and that's another really important point. The, the stain of slavery um, or the stigma of slavery can, can last for, for generations. And this, again, is a, a worldwide phenomenon as Orlando Patterson shows in his book, which is a global interpretation, a global examination of slavery through, through time. And, and you also find that situation in Suriname, so I'm moving closer to my area of exp expertise because I don't know too much about the modern Middle East or Sub-Saharan Africa that you refer to. But in, in Suriname as well, the stigma of slavery survived a person even after they were manumitted and had children and grandchildren. But in Suriname, what was operative was a whitening clause. And by this clause, if you, if you as a manumitted person married a person reputed to be white and your children married a person reputed to be white, then that stigma of slave origins and of being of sub-Saharan descent would gradually disappear. And I realized this when I was reading the wills of 18th century Suriname, where I would read a will of a person in Paramaribo, the capital city of Suriname, and he owned a lot of people. And there was no mention of his race. So in, in these wills, the race would be designated as mulato, mulatin in, in Dutch, um, or a neger, neger means black in Dutch. And there was no designation for this person. And only in other wills did I find out that in other social contexts, he was identified as, as a mulatto. So the, the stigma can disappear in, in context, depending on the context, but it also can disappear through time. And because your article is so rich in primary sources, I, sources, I must share the story of Jan Jacob van Par Paramaribo. And you write, in 1780, he arranged for the manumission of Daniel and Esther, probably his children, to whom he bequeathed their own mother, the Negro girl or maid Martha, who should remain enslaved for their use and to take care of them. What a story. Yes, and that, that illuminates something quite remarkable. Another pattern that I found is that the enslaved mothers typically did not merit manumission. The masters and mistresses chose not to release the slave mother from slavery, but they would release her children from slavery on occasion. And by the way, let's remember that only 1% of the population was ever manumitted per year. So it was, it was very difficult to get manumitted. If you were of un, undiluted, so, so to speak, undiluted sub-Saharan African descent, you had almost a zero chance of being manumitted. If you had some kind of European ancestry, your chances were greater. But regardless of the ancestry of these mothers, I found out that the pattern was the, the mother did not man, merit manumission and the owner would manumit the children perhaps as a gift to the mother, but it was kind of an odd gift, at least from my eyes, because these children were often given their enslaved mother 
to serve them throughout their entire lives. And that's what Jan Jakob of Paramaribo was doing. It, it, to people like us living in the 21st century, these ideas sound dubious, but I'm going to give another striking example from J Jamaica. In Jamaica, the Maroons who fought for freedom, they also owned slaves. And the white planters who impregnated Black women, when these women gave birth, the children often sided with their fathers and white relatives and would even help their fathers to suppress slave revolts. Right. So what, what you're underscoring there is the myth of slave solidarity. And there is a book by Blasingame that came out several decades ago called The Slave Community, in which he depicted a utopian slave community. And he posited that the slave community was a place of shelter against white atrocity and the unpredictability and horrors of slave, of slave life for, for the unfree. Um, but, um, but in fact, if you dig a little deeper, that the solidarity that is assumed is not part of reality. And Jeff Foray, a historian a few years ago, came out with a very important book called Slave Against Slave, where he documented the lack of solidarity amongst in, um, enslaved people. And uh, he, he looked at cases of rape, violence, theft, and on and on. What I'm doing is something similar in my work. I, 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 I'm very interested in lack of solidarity within groups, in this case, within the, the community, if you can even call it a community, the community of enslaved people. And um, since you mentioned the Jamaican Maroons, they were by far the most important Maroon community in the Americas, I think, or at least of the Caribbean. You're you correct. Also, right? the, 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 today, the Maroons, they still live in a separate part of Jamaica, claiming to follow their own laws. Yes, it's, it's really a remarkable civilization. Parallel to what you find in Suriname, there are six Maroon tribes still living today in Suriname, although their, their life is very, very much in danger today, in part because of migration to the capital city. But I'm getting off on a tangent. If you study those communities, the Maroon communities in Suriname, you will see that beginning in the mid 18th century, thereabouts, some of these communities made treaties with the Dutch government. And they agreed to track down, to help the Dutch government track down runaway slaves. And uh, in return, they would be recognized as political autonomous entities in the rainforest. And they, they would get um, periodic gifts from the Dutch government, such as tools, luxury goods, and, um, and even Maroon tribes that were not pacified by the colonial government they would um, periodically raid plantations for tools and women. In other words, they, they would kidnap enslaved women um, for their use, sexual use, and also to, to work, to carry out work. So this is another example of the myth of solidarity among slaves or among runaway slaves and slaves. It's just a myth. And I think the problem, so I, I'm based in North America in the United States, the problem, as I see it, with, with so, so many studies and so many approaches to slavery is that the ethnicity is foregrounded, that is blackness. But I think that's a mistake. And I think we need to foreground economy, which I know you study very closely, and also look more universally. So not assume that North American or US people of African descent are the norm and also not, not assume that the slave system in the US South or even in the North are um, paradigmatic. We, we need to have a universal, um, a universal framework that goes through time in order to get an accurate picture. The myth of racial solidarity ought to be this privilege. And we're going to speak more, more about the Maroon. So in the, the American South, the Maroons raided slave plantations, so planters would often pay enslaved individuals to capture the Maroons. Whereas in Jamaica, the reverse was true. But what people often do not say about Jamaica is that the Maroon community was also divisive. Whenever there was a, a, a battle between the British and the Maroons, there was never the guarantee that the, Maro the Maroons would orchestrate a mount to, to defeat the British. 
some of them actually sided with the British and Kenneth Bilby has researched this topic. His article on the matter over is quite old, published in 1984. So th this is far a field of my expertise, but I've, I've noted it down and I, I definitely want to read about that. And yeah, it's another example of, of the lack of solidarity, but also the autonomy, the political autonomy that um, these autonomous communities of Maroons, they had their own, their own political agenda. And, and therefore you can't assume their reaction to, uh, to any kind of colonial rule or competing colonial rule. The other thing I want to share with you from my research is I, I studied a man by the name of John Henry Lance. He was a British barrister who got an appointment to act as the judge commissary in Suriname just after the slave trade was abolished. And he came to Suriname in the 1820s to act as this commissary judge to fight the illegal slave trade. And he would take many trips into the interior, into the rainforest of Suriname, and he would meet with Maroons sometimes to actually deliver gifts from the government. And, um, and he kept a diary. He had a journal of one of these expeditions. And this journal was never published. And it was clearly meant for his own internal consumption. I have no indication that he ever was writing for an audience or intended to publish it. And in this journal, he notes that he was talking with one of the members of the Maroon community, who was a lower class member of the community. And they had a conversation where John Lance said to him, well, why don't you go down river and do such and such? And this, enslaved, this Maroon person, right, who is ostensibly not a slave because he's a Maroon, he said, no, I can't. My master will not allow me to do that. I do not have freedom of movement. So that, that's an anecdotal um, indication that, of course, there are hierarchies, even in communities that have self-emancipated themselves by running away from slavery successfully. That does not mean that, that uh, the hierarchy is done away with. The, the hierarchy not only continues to exist, but in many ways mimics the hierarchy of the, the slave society that the Maroons were fleeing from. And just one example, another example of that is that John Lance noted the use of corporal punishment so that the Maroon leaders were carrying out the same corporal punishment um, among their, you know, their second class members of their community, the same kinds of physical punishments that they had themselves endured on the plantations before running away. Aviva, you often repeat that you're not an expert, but you sound like an expert. Well, I'm curious about the world, and what one of the things I really love doing is talking to people and and learning about their thoughts. and And you're a very special person to talk to because you come from economy, and that's actually a, a path that I'm heading towards in my new project, which is not about slavery, but I'm really interested in how economists look at the world and how they study human society. And I've actually read a few of your articles, and I, I I'm very interested in how you think. So I'm trying to retrain my brain to look at human society through the eyes of economy. Well, uh, Aviva, when academics appear on this show, I often say to them, you are smart. I don't have a PhD. I just have a BA from a university in a developing country. Well, I, I would say to you, you are on the right path for a PhD. You've already interviewed some of the luminaries of the field of economics and sociology. So I would say to you, go for it. All right, thanks. And since we're on the myth of racial solidarity, if you are unfamiliar with his literature, I must introduce you to Justin Roberts. Justin Roberts has a paper on inequality in slave societies, and he was literally measuring slave societies, not societies that are characterized by slavery, but societies where slaves were important. So for instance, elite slaves had access to more resources, and because of this, it was better, it was easier for them to participate in the internal marketing system. He refers to it as the economy of energy. They had more time. And elite slaves were often responsible for trading other slaves. And fascinatingly, when the when new slaves from Africa 
were forceful were forcefully taken to the Caribbean, they encountered a process known as seasoning, and the planters usually would worry that the established slaves would enslave the new slaves because some of them were quite aggressive. Oh, good. Thank you for mentioning his book. I, I actually have not read him yet, and I'm, I'm definitely going to do that. But since you mentioned e equality in slave societies, on a related point, another problem, I think, of studying slave societies is that the, the white population is ignored in the sense that only the elites are paid attention to in general. There are a few historians, really great historians, who look at the lower classes among the whites, but they were also extremely exploited people, often living on, on the margins and on the brink of starvation and, uh, and lack of health care. And uh, I think that when we when we consider inequality in slave societies, of course, we have to look at hierarchy within the so-called slave community. But we also cannot assume that whites had solidarity. Uh, in certain respects, there was a great expression of white solidarity. But if we insert class into the formula, there was a, a huge gap between the small elites who were extremely wealthy and the majority of whites who were not only poor, but often meandering as a function of their poverty. And that, that actually explains why there are many close relationships between enslaved people and poor whites. For example, on the island of Barbados, there's an archeologist who's written about this and he's looked at inequality among whites in, in the Caribbean through the lens of archeology. span And he, he finds a similar um, similar pottery in the uh, the ruins of where poor white people lived versus where enslaved people lived. And he argues that the similar pottery shows that they had very close trading relations. And of course, we know that there was a lot of intermarriage or sexual relations between these two groups. Jerome Andler polluted this point several years ago in a landmark text. He argued that in Barbados, even though whites were contemptuous of blacks, they respected professional blacks and hardworking slaves, where slaves, whereas working class whites were often poor and as such earned their contempt. Yes, that's right. And and despite those insights, I so much of the literature, I think, just remains. A, an analysis devoid of class, because especially in the United States, the US and most of the scholarship comes out of the US is, is just very race obsessed and, and has not given sufficient attention to economy in my view. I, I, there, there are some academics who attempt to produce a balanced analysis of slavery but in the age of political correctness and critical race perspectives, academia is morphing into a mess. Well, I shouldn't say morphing, it is already a, a mess. So for younger people who may not have the time to read as widely as some of us, they're being miseducated. Okay, so miseducation is an interesting word. And I guess, I guess uh, the, the approach I would take is which books are being highlighted as, as important. So we're, we're very pressured to read those and we should read them and they're mostly very excellent. But there, there will always be areas of scholarship that get short shrift and that's why I make a point of it when I'm researching an article, I always look for articles or books that, that aren't in the limelight and to see if there's a, a, a competing narrative that these scholars are producing that is getting overlooked in the scholarly discourse. So um, I guess rather than miseducated, the, the approach I take is, I'm just gonna try to read as widely as possible, especially people who don't make it into the limelight and who are finding things, by the way, that don't make it into the limelight. And I'll, I'll just give you a random example that, that occurred to me this week. There is a, a genealogical periodical that is popular. It's not scholarly at all. It's called uh, We Rutu, and it's a, um, a Surinamese genealogical society that puts out, I think, like two or three issues a year. 
And I, I went through this and most of the contributors are not scholars, but they have such interesting ideas, really interesting titles for the articles. And they're clearly thinking in a way that's independent of academia. So the, these are the kinds of things I read also. And these are the people who sit down in the archives day after day because they're looking for a long lost ancestor from 200 years ago. And while they're doing that, they find amazing stuff that, that other academics may not have found. So those are two, two reasons I like to read not, not only widely, but also read non-academics who are writing about history to see what their ideas are and to see what their discoveries are. The, the name of the book is Unappropriated People, Freedmen in the Slave Society of Barbados. It's an excellent tome and we ought to revisit it more frequently. That's Handler, Jerome yeah, Handler. Jo jo Joel, yes, jo Joseph, Jerome Handler. And what I also like about the book is that Jerome Andler, Andler painted three Black people in, in Barbados as autonomous agents. They were not depicted as traitors for supporting slavery, but rather as a rational actor, using the rational actor, actor, actor model in, in economics. Yes, that's right. And I, I, I actually remember him in that book writing about particularly paying attention to gender, which I think is really important in a slave society, particularly um, a Caribbean slave society. And I remember him talking about uh, mothers who, who would basically pawn, pawn their daughters. They would basically sell their daughters into sexual slavery to a moneyed, to, to a white soldier who could help them, um, help them economically. But clearly they were pimping out, I guess pimping out is a better term. They were pimping out their daughters. And I, I don't mean this in a value Latin judgment way at all. I mean that when you're living in a society where most people are really oppressed and it's a brutal, vicious capitalistic society, your um, possibilities for bettering yourself and your daughter are very, very limited. And, and uh, sexual services was a very important way to self-betterment. And, um, and that's why one of the reasons I appreciated his book is because he looked at this very neutrally without, without, putting, without wondering, oh, how could a mother do this to her own children, but rather looking at it pragmatically, which I'm sure they did as well centuries ago. Yeah, Jerome is really dispassionate. So that, and this is one of the reasons why I like his book. But on the point of women, women were crucial in the slave economy. In the Caribbean, for instance, the internal marketing system was dynamic and dominated by women. And, and furthermore, we have many actual examples of women who played a, a great role in stimulating wealth creation during the slave era. For instance, Old Doll. Old Doll was the matron of an elite slave family in Barbados. And can you say something more about where you're going yeah, yeah, with yeah, this? Yeah, yes, yes. So, o Old Doll, she was a member of an elite slave family in, in Barbados. There was also another businesswoman, Rach Rach Rachel Pringle Paul Green. And okay. yeah, so the, the, this is the point that I'm making. Wom women were really important in the slave economy and they're also understudied. Absolutely. And I love Marissa Fuentes' work here. Um, in, a, in a way, I, I, I'm not sure her, her approach is dispassionate, to use your word, but it, it is clearly critical of the utopian model. And she pays careful attention to violence. Among, um, among one of the mistresses that you mentioned and the violence she meted out to, to her enslaved worker. And, and yes, the, and I, I believe she was a madame as well. So she ran, she ran a brothel. And this was of course, one of the only paths to wealth for women. And it was a vital part of the economy as Fuentes' work showed. Um, they serviced um, local men, but also on an island, of course, you have a lot of visitors and soldiers and sailors, and they serviced them as well. And what so when I what I really like about Fuentes's work is she she says, um, you know, it's it's really problematic to to talk about um, to praise a former slave for being very clever economically um, and, you know, getting herself out of poverty when her means to get herself out of poverty is 
through exploitation of people remaining in slavery. So Fuentes is criticizing the scholarship, and I think she, she right, rightly does that. She criticizes the scholars for just praising people like Old Dahl or um, uh, what's the other person? Paul Green. Rachel, yeah, Rachel. Rachel Paul, she criticizes scholars for, for praising these women without looking at, at the very complex <laughs> and, and obvious detail that they, they are flourishing be, through exploitation of people remaining in slavery. So, and I, I think that's one of the problems of scholarship, which is um, passionate, rather dispassionate. They, um, you can also, just to jump to West Africa for a moment, if you look at the scholarship on West Africa, you see this very peculiar term recruiting people for slavery rather than enslaving people or you know, uh, raiding a community and capturing human beings and enslaving them. The scholars will, will often use the word recruiting people as if you know, you're recruiting members of your family. And, and of course in West African slavery, um, Ghana in this, in this instance, there, there was that incorporation, so slaves, some slaves were incorporated into the family, but it's much more complex than that. And they, they didn't entirely become kin, as you mentioned, and even generations later, the stigma of slavery could still be there. But, um, but the, um, much of the scholarship praises um, African women, for example, your African women, women of typically um, fathered by a white uh, West India Company uh, employee and an indigenous African woman. And the literature will praise these women for being so clever and amassing so much wealth, but without complicating that narrative and saying, wait a minute, they are achieving this wealth because they are exploiting other human beings. Brilliant point. I have only a cursory understanding of the women of Senegal. I believe, I don't know how it's pronounced. It's S-I-G-N-A-R-E. Signer, yeah, yeah, Signer, Signer women of Senegal. They, in a sense, were involved in the slave trade in the 1800s. And as you rightly said, these women were cunning and exploitative, but people paint them as heroes and great entrepreneurs yeah it it's um it makes me uh it makes me really chuckle that that um a person can write without being conscious of of that uh, of that paradox or contradiction as the case may be but again i i think it's it's just it's a problem of the hero villain model which was um which is the way that history originally emerged as a field you would write about your heroes and you would write about your villains and the practice of history writing was in order to emulate a hero that you admired. And the idea of that kind of history writing is that if you read um, heroification history, you could too become a great man, great man history. Um, and I, I think uh, uh, some of the scholarship has a residue of that approach that when a person sits down to write about the past, they are looking for their good guys and their bad guys and their good women and their bad women. And I think as historians, we have to be really conscious of this and, and not embrace a, a good, a, a villain hero paradigm because it's going to affect our analysis. And even more importantly, it's going to block us from seeing certain things and searching for certain things that otherwise we might not see or find. It's similar to the issue of market. So a, a market, firstly, we're still a market, but it's a repressive market. And economists, to indicate that pre-colonial Africa engaged in, in market activities, they discuss slavery like it's a normal activity. That's right. <laughs> right. Which, which goes back to our point that, that slavery is endemic to all human societies, at least sedentary human societies, non-nomadic societies. Absolutely. It, it's normal. So if we normalize slavery too, I think we'll get a very different narrative. Alvin Wilson was a great historian. He was one of the first people to chronicle sl Black slavery, or should I say ownership of slaves by Blacks. And since we're still on the topic of the myth of racial solidarity, Calvin Wilson said that in Africa, Blacks owned slaves. Many of these people were from tribal societies and upon relocating to the, to the US, they transferred these tr 
tribal conflicts with, with them. This is just another point on the topic of the myth of racial unity. Yeah, I remember reading that. And so I'm not an Africanist. And I, in, when I read, wrote my article, Close Can Ownership, I thought, ooh, I'm treading on really thin ground here. I'm not trained as an Africanist, so I, I can't really contribute towards the debate about where close kin ownership in the Americas comes from. Is it a product of hemispheric American slave societies, or is it actually a, a cultural survival, even though African survivals are not thought in that way in something that might embarrass um, some people living today? Um, but uh, I couldn't really contribute to that debate. But in my article, I said I acknowledged that close kin ownership existed in West Africa. But I, I concluded, maybe based on the fact that I'm, you know, my my field is the, the Americas and not West Africa, I concluded that this is a product of hemispheric American societies and maybe slave society more broadly. And close kin ownership is not an African survival. Now, why, why did I say that? Well, in part because the earliest cases of close kin ownership that I found were actually initiated by white masters or masters and mistresses who were reputed as white. As you know, white is a very difficult term um, to use in, in, a, in the Caribbean and in Brazil. But those earliest cases dating to the 17 teens showed a, a white master or mistress bequeathing a man, manumitting one of their slaves and bequeathing a close kin. So, for example, I came across a case of a, a, an owner, I think his name was Pardo, and he had um, a, a dozens of slaves, and he manumitted a young man and bequeathed this young man his own parents. So his parents were legally bound to him in slavery without the prospect or intention of manumission. And Pardo was a reputed white. His, his legal status was a white. He was actually a Portuguese Jew. And, um, and I found a number of other cases like this from around the same time. So that's another reason why I rejected the possibility of close kin ownership being an African survival. I actually think it, it is, um, it's a uh, homegrown in in the Caribbean, in this uh, case, uh, Aviva, I act well. You already explain. You already explained the issue quite thoroughly, but I wanted you to mention Igor Kopitov. How do you pronounce his last name? Oh, okay, Igor uh, Kopitov and Ma Suzanne Myers. Yes, tell us a little about their research. Oh, okay, yeah. So the, this again is kind of. Um, far afield of what I do, but so Kopitov was an anthropologist, Meyer was a historian, and they, um, they wrote about close kin ownership, they didn't call it that, they called that kinship slavery, and they, they, tried, they tried to understand whether it was benevolent or not, and their, uh, you know, their research I think came out in the 1960s, so it's uh, several generations ago, but the important thing there is that they're they're contributing towards a debate that still exists, I believe, and that is the idea that there can be such thing as benevolent slavery um, or, or vicious, horrible slavery. In my book, I reject that dichotomy, and I and, and some other historians also maintain that slavery is a well, to use the ahistorical word dehumanizing, it's a dehumanizing institution, and there can never be benevolent slavery. And it, actually, if you do um, very close analysis of kinship slavery in Africa and even the that kind of slavery that exists today, it is no party to be to be in that system as as um, as an enslaved person to a kin group. So I, I think the other problem with a lot of the writing is the assumption of what is good and what is a good life. And we really have to examine that deep, deeply. What do we mean by good? What do we mean, what do we mean by well-being? What do we mean by happiness? This is artfully recounted by Sean Stilwell in his book, Slavery and Slaving in African History. And I must say, it, I read the book in soft copy, but Stilwell posits that in, in Africa, the slave was an outsider. And there are many cases suggesting that 
slaves were not treated well. Right, and I, I don't know that book, and and hopefully you'll you'll um, share with me those titles, but. Um, so yes, and the, the, what I can add to this is again, the work of, of Kevin Bales, slavery, I think it's called slavery under, under a diff, different name. And his work, it, it looks at cases of unfreedom around the world today in capitalistic societies. And the, the important factor here is, you know, profit driven society. When you have such a vicious economic environment, you are going to get, you are going to see extreme exploitation of human beings. And, and he shows that um, all over the developing world, but also in the United States, in, um, in situations of certainly work workshops, uh, industrial workshops, but also domestic servitude situations. It's, it's simply a myth that there can be any kind of um, of equality or dignity, in my view, in, in a situation of unfree labor. Yes, and this myth is debunked by the numerous examples of human sacrifices, sacrifices in slave societies. Some societies in West Africa actually dedicated slaves to be sacrificed. And are you talking about burial with owners or sacrifice? No, I'm, I'm talking about sla slaves who were dedicated to either the shrine or slaves who were dedicated to be sacrificed. Like in the Daomi and Asante Empire, slaves were often selected to be sacrificed. Okay, that, yeah, that's and, really important. And the, the, the Daomi Empire really valued sacrifices because the em kings would argue that sacrifices were, were were linked to the day to the Daumian culture of militarism so when the british in a sense forced them to abolish slavery and human sacrifice they argued that the british were imposing a foreign culture on them yeah which makes sense to me so yeah if you're going to um if you're going to support indigenous rights you have to be consistent and um and when when you are there is a clash of values that you have to face and, and deal with. So I, I don't know about that, that cultural manifestation that you're speaking about, but I would also be interested if slaves were the only ones who were being sacrificed or were other members of society. For example, um, uh, wives who, uh, who, uh, whose husbands got cross with them, were they also subject to this or was yeah, it? Slaves and outsiders were sacrificed, just like in the Aztec Empire where prisoners of war were, were sacrificed. Usually insiders were not sacrificed, but in some societies like the, the, the Mayans, it was, an, it was seen as an honor to be sacrificed. Yeah, so in, yeah, and in this case, um, this uh, brings to mind, of course, the work of Moses Finley, who is a classicist, a historian of the classical period. And one of his tenets is that the pattern in slavery is that the people who get enslaved are outsiders. They, they are different from the human owning class in religion, in ethnicity, in language, in geographical origin. And that, that, that does seem to be a helpful rule for many cases, but again, the issue of close kin ownership uh, forces us to nuance that, that constant that Moses Finley argued for. So there are insiders who, who can also be subject to slavery, not just, not just foreigners. And we're going to, to, to get to this case soon, but before we do so, during our conversation on women, on women, I actually wanted to reference an article by Christine Walker. And Christine Walker reminds us that in Jamaica, the mortality rates were high. And as such, women would often become widows. And because they were widows, they inherited the wealth and prestige of their husband of their husbands, and this compelled them to be to become entrepreneurs. So again, I must point out the role of women in slave economies. Yes, very good. And and the importance of, of uh, disease, of widespread disease, and the impact of disease. And we can go back to the work of, of McNeil on plagues and people. And um, so right, if you shift, if you shift the focus to disease and high mortality rates, 
then then you also have to um, to acknowledge the very narrow opportunities that people had that women had when they were left to their own devices or wealthy women who inherited their their husband's wealth. So um, so disease is also a really important thing to think about in terms of how it affected female economy. And another important point that I didn't remember to state earlier is that in Barbados, white slavery is still disputed. Some like Jerome and Andler argues that indentured servitude can be distinguished from slavery, but I read a book published by Hillary Beckles, and Hillary Beckles in the book cited a, a, a case where the law did not necessarily deem them to be slaves, but they were treated like slaves and even called slaves. Yeah, that, that is an interesting debate too. And my favorite document for shedding light on this is a, a firsthand account by a person called Morley. And he was a, a British, he came from a well-to-do legal family, but he lost his fortune because he was orphaned. And he was uh, conscripted into indentured servitude. I believe in Barbados, it's been years since I read and taught the book. But anyway, he I really like his memoir from the 18th century because he juxtaposes the status of slaves that he met in, I think he was also in, in the US. Um, was it Philadelphia? But anyway, he juxtaposes their status with his own as an indentured servant. And there are so many parallels, you know, the lack of freedom of movement, the severe corporal punishment. But it seems to me that the, the one distinctive feature is the lack of hereditary slavery. So indentured servants did not pass down their status of slavery to their children biologically and automatically. But of course, slaves did if they were women and they had a child those those children would be automatically slaves so that that seems to be a very important distinction that there was theoretically a way out if you survived the diseases as a white endangered servant there was theoretically a way out of slavery for for you and for your children and on the point of hereditary, hereditary slavery the assumption that hereditary slavery in africa was unlikely is also a feeble bunny face i obituary he has several articles on slavery in africa slaves could inherit the status of their mothers in in, in west african states okay right matrilineal slavery yes yeah and again far far afield from what i do but but exactly right so slavery um, was was transmitted through through the mother also in the hemispheric Americas, it, going back to Roman law, of course. I've read Dylan Penning Grot, and I really enjoy this quote. And you write, Dylan Penning Grot, analyzing the intersection between property and kinship among blacks in the U.S. South and West Africa, observes individuals making powerful claims over family members to work him, work him, hire them out turn them over to someone else or give them away. Really, right. really. And he, right. And and that that those um though that data that he uncovered was in a post-slavery world. And that really struck me when I read it because it, it implicitly he couldn't imagine that these kinds of dynamics within the family could have existed still during the slave regime before 1863 or 65. And um, and I, I think there's really something to be said for being a comparativist. So for doing dense archival work in many contexts, not just the US South, but also the Caribbean, Brazil, and actually across time. And then, you know, you can start to look to look for things and not make assumptions that certain things are products of emancipation. And there's also the argument that during slavery, both white slave owners and non-white slave owners would maintain family structure as a way to exert autonomy over the enslaved because people often feared, feared losing their families. So this is the idea of 
keeping somebody enslaved in order to keep them within the family is that where you're going yeah that? yeah so you would legate slave to to someone let's say for example you own john you mary jane owned john brown and mary jane would legate her slave to john brown or mary jane owned a plantation and john brown in order to get john brown to behave himself she would threaten him by saying i'm going to sell your family so this yes so keeping keeping families the threat of destroying families was often employed as a tool to keep slave communities united this is the point i'm making right right and and in the cases i found where you know so the the assumption is that that slave masters of slave origins, they kept their kin in slavery to protect them. The problem with that argument is that many of these masters who had roots in slavery owned dozens and dozens of slaves. And surely most of them were not biologically um, or, um, or re related to them or related through a sexual relationship. So it, for that argument to be true, then you would have to assume it, it just it just doesn't make sense. If somebody can afford to manumit their kin, why would they not want to do that? And the the only answer could be, um, well, I suppose you could speculate and say the the master did not have enough money to support the person in freedom, perhaps. But then the the person is an able bodied person, and he's bringing in vekhelt, so weekly money for his master. So the whole thing just doesn't make sense. The idea that that um, manumitted people kept their kin in slavery to protect them certainly that could be part of the reason, especially in poor families. But many of these masters owned dozens of slaves, so there has to be another motivation for keeping them in slavery. And the, your article is filled with primary sources, and I and I like the sources. I'm familiar with some of them, like the case of Ali Burton. I've read some of his work, and you also I've read some of his works, and you also cite Michael Johnson. And I believe Michael Johnson wrote the book on William Ellison, a a mulatto slave owner who had little sympathy for for his slaves and blacks. Right, Black Masters, yeah, that yes. was a, really, a breakthrough book uh, based on a manuscript, I believe, that was found in, in the foundations of a house. I mean, the, the way that he came to the topic, um, he and his co-author was is really extraordinary. And um, if you look at that text really closely, you will see that that man, Ellison, who was born a slave, but then became manumitted, the way that he treated his commonwealth, common law wife, was not as a, um, a sexual partner slash wife, but actually he was treating her as proper property, uh, keeping her in slavery when theoretically he could have manumitted her. Um, so I, and his children as well, and that's dealt very superficially by the authors in Black Masters, but I picked up on it and I said, you know, this is exactly, this is a replication of, of what's going on in broader society. The, and uh, in North America, it's very hard to find these cases because El people like Ellison were very, very unusual. North America was different from Brazil and the Caribbean in that it was very, very hard to be a manumitted person of sub-Saharan descent and the communities were very small. By contrast, in the Caribbean and Brazil, most free people were of, of slave origins themselves at a certain point in time. So, and, and even, even within that exception to the rule in North America, you see the same pattern happening, which I found really fascinating. Do you mind if I loop back to something you earlier said? You mentioned you were working, I know this is an interview with me, but I'm also interested in your research. Can you talk a little bit about the article that you wrote and what the occasion of the piece was? Who, who asked you to write it? Which piece, the self-interest piece? I, it was the one that you mentioned on on slavery, in fact, and I think uh, close kin ownership or, or um, ownership oh, of slaves. Oh, oh that article. Consent. Yeah, I wrote that article for the, the Mises Institute. So I'm a writer and I like to write articles. It, it wasn't commissioned. Okay, so they commissioned you to write it. No, no, it was not commissioned. It was not commissioned. Yes. Okay. 
So you you came to this topic of your own interest. Yes, yes. Okay. Yeah, and I, I would love to see that. All right, I, 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 I can send you the, the link. It's not very long, and I'm sure that you're going to like it. I, I enjoyed writing it. I also cited the work of Barbara Crot, Crot Amer, and she looks at the ownership of slaves by Native Americans. Right, yes. Um, Black and Indian, is that the name of the book? I, I don't remember the, the name of the book, but it's a popular book for people who like history. Yes, yes, it's been picked up by um, by uh, a prison reading group, a, a, a reading group that advocates on the behalf of, of uh, wrongly pe wrongly imprisoned people picked that up as their choice of the month. It was advertised at my university. Yeah. And one of the things I, I really like about her scholarship is she she warns her readers do not idealize the slavery, the slave regime under indigenous owners in North America. And she focuses on the, I remember there, there's one part where she focuses on the, um, the arduous work that enslaved Africans had to carry out under Indian masters and the repetitive and the repetition and boredom of that work as well. But I, that really struck me, like, don't idealize this, you know, j just because these are so-called marginalized people, you know, indigenous people owning um, slaves of a different geographical origin, don't, don't idealize slavery. And I think that that's a very good lesson. We should not idealize slavery. I agree. Slavery is not a luxury for the enslaved. And this is our last point. This example is quite shocking. The example of how do you pronounce his name? Kwahu, K-W-A-U-W. Oh, yes. yes. Oh, this was, this was a, oh, okay, so I just want to tell you the context of, of him. Um, so I, I was finishing my article, Close Kin Ownership, and I, I had found lots of snippets of Close Kin Ownership all over the Americas, you know, Trinidad, Barbados, North America, Suriname, of course, but I didn't find a real meaty case. Um, the closest I could get was the wills where people um, did express some of their sentiments, but wills are, as you know, very formulaic. You know, they follow repetitive patterns that are repeated by other testators. And I was really looking for a meaty case that would drive my point home that yes, this really was slavery. Formerly enslaved people really did own their close kin as slaves. And, um, and this, this man that I found, uh, he lived in late 18th century Suriname, and he was taken to court by his son, who was also his slave. So the master, the father, he was very wealthy. He owned many slaves, and he had many parallel slave families with different enslaved African women. And, and one of these families produced a son who, according to the court testimony, thought of himself as a free man, even though he was legally a slave. So he joined the fire brigade. He even traveled back to Europe and became a baptized Christian. So, and he even bought a plot of land and his own slave to serve him while he was in slavery. So that this is interesting because it's the late 18th century where you don't really expect these kinds of possibilities for enslaved people. But the point of the story is that this son brought his um, uh, that, that this father brought his son to court because the son refused to acknowledge that he was a slave owned by his father and that his responsibility was to bring in Weichelt, to bring in um, uh, weekly money for his father. And, um, you know, now I don't remember all the details of the ca case right now. It could have been the son who brought it to case, which also tells us that, you know, enslaved people had a lot of legal rights within certain contexts. Uh, and it could be that the father countersued. I don't remember all, all of the details, but the upshot is that the court agreed with the father slash master and said, hey, you are indeed his son, but you're also his slave. And you, your responsibility is you have to support your father slash master, especially in his old age. So where the court case ends, the son slash slave loses the case. 
But what I found really interesting about it was the dialogue between the father master and his son slave. And there was one dialogue where, where the son slave says to his father, I can't believe you would even call me a slave. That is a hated word. And you yourself should know that because you were born in slavery. So you get snippets of the arguments between the father and the son, the master and the slave. And for me, it was proof positive that these dynamics that I was sensing were there, but I couldn't prove it. This court case was proof positive that these dynamics were real. Yeah, this story is pathetic. Like, it's unbelievable. I could not fathom that a father really wanted his son to serve him as a slave. So this point is very yeah. important. It, in this legal case and also the wills that I looked at, usually the master father did not acknowledge biological paternity. So this is a master father himself born in slavery, now manumitted, and having multiple children with enslaved African women. And he is not acknowledging biological fatherhood with any of them. However, a lucky few will will um, receive that recognition and it typically happens over time. And you can imagine that it's a, a relationship that the child is consciously cultivating with his father. So in, in this case, and in many of the wills, the will might say, oh yes, and, um, and among my belongings are my slave. And it, it's obvious that this slave child is the biological child of the master, but he will not acknowledge that. The master will not acknowledge that in the will until maybe a decade or two later when the master decides to recognize paternity. And then the, the name of the slave, let's say, is Petrus. And whereas before he would say in an earlier will, he might say, my slave Petrus, Two decades later, he will say, my son, Petrus, I'm manumitting my son, Petrus. So that also shows, I mean, it might be shocking. Wow, how can a father not acknowledge parentage of his own slave son? But the fact is that even in the discourse, the, the, the discourse was an expression of, I'm not going to acknowledge kinship with you until I'm ready to manumit you. All right. So... Aviva, I'm really enjoying your conversation, but unfortunately, I have to wrap up. So, bye. It was a pleasure. It was a pleasure as well. Yes. All right. Thank bye, you Aviva. Thank so much for the opportunity. Bye.